Hi, everyone. I'm Miss Sylvia from the Miller Branch of the Howard County Library System. And we are excited to celebrate Women's History Month with you today. And we are going to be talking about trailblazers. So thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. My name is Miss Heidi. And I'm also from the Miller Branch of the Howard County Library System. And this is such an important month, the month of March. Every year, we celebrate women's history. So let's talk a bit, a little bit about what we're going to be discussing today. Look at this. Today's goals, we're going to review some of the history into, that went into the creation of Women's History Month. We're going to identify some of the really well-known and lesser-known firsts in women's history, those people who came before and really led the way. We're going to look at some current female change makers, including those who are young and young adults who are really making a difference right now. We're going to look at a way you can become active in your community. And then, oh my goodness, we have so many resources for you to keep learning about Women's History Month and all the wonderful women who have gone before us. Right, Miss Sylvia? That's right. Okay, so let's get started. And first thing we're going to do is test our knowledge and see what we already know about Women's History Month with a true false quiz. Now, it's okay if you get some of them wrong because these are the things we're going to be learning about during our session today, but we're just going to see what we already know. So let's start. So question number one, Women's History Month was first celebrated in the United States in 1909. What do you think, Miss Heidi? 1909. I don't think so. I think that seems a little early to me. I'm going to say false, maybe. Okay, let's see. That's right. That's false. So we're going to talk about when the United States and other parts of the world started celebrating women's history. Question two. Women were unable to own property, earn wages, or get an education well into the 1800s. True or false? Oh my goodness. I think that's true. And I'm sad that that is true, Miss Sylvia. That is true. Women have been working for a really long time to get equal rights and representation within our country and around the world. Question three, the 19th amendment gave women the right to vote in the United States in 1920. True or false? Ooh, 1920. It should have been way before this, Miss Sylvia, but I do think that's true. That is true. It's been over 100 years. Last year was the 100th uh, anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And question number four. The National Women's History Museum is physically located on the National Mall. True or false? Hmm. That is a tough one, Miss Sylvia. Um, you know what? I'm really not sure about that one, but I don't think it's a real building yet. I think they let's find out, it, but I'm not sure. That is false. So we're going to learn more about the National Women's History Museum and how it's formatted now and maybe some changes that are coming in place in the future. So before we really get into things, we're going to start by watching a video that tells us about International Women's Day. So exciting, Miss Sylvia. Yes. March 8th is International Women's Day. It's a day to honor women everywhere in the world, recognize their many achievements, and think about the special challenges they face. From Malala Yousafzai, the youngest Nobel Prize winner ever, to Oprah Winfrey, one of the most successful business leaders in the world, women have achieved success in every walk of life. But it was not always that way. A little over 100 years ago, in 1908, 15,000 courageous women marched in New York City demanding better jobs, fair pay, and voting rights. That's right, women were not even allowed to vote. Some working women got the idea for a special day to talk about women's rights, and in 1911, the first International Women's Day was celebrated. 
The United Nations supported the idea in 1975 with an International Woman's Year. And since then, many countries have joined in by recognizing March 8th as a special day to honor women's advancement, while remembering to help women gain equality in all areas of life. Today, there are female astronauts and sports legends, politicians and scientists. But we still have a long way to go in making sure all girls in the world can have a happy future and can fulfill their potential. On March 8th every year, thousands of events are held throughout the world to celebrate women. In the United States, there are parades, celebrations and community events that honor women. The U.S. also honors the entirety of March as Women's History Month. What woman do you most admire and why? Mm, I love that question, Miss Sylvia. That gives That's me a, great a lot question. to think about because there's a lot of women these days that we can admire. And I wanted to take a look at some of the women who came first in history and really started this whole trailblazing journey of very powerful women doing what they needed to do. So some of these go back a really long time. So to do this, I'm going to share my screen real quick with you. And we're going to have a fun game, just a little bit. So on here, there are several names of people who lived a long time ago. And some of the names you may recognize, but some you might not. And we're just going to learn a little bit about them as we go forward. So we're going to spin and see who we get. Here we go. Oh my goodness. Yay. Okay. We landed on Bodhika. She is a really neat warrior. Right now, I am looking from this book. It's called Her Story, 50 Women and Girls Who Shook Up the World. And this is by Katherine Halligan. And it has a lot of women in there, including Bodhika. And she was a Celtic warrior who lived in the area of Britain. Before it was England or Ireland or Scotland, it was just all one place called Britain. And she had to fight for the land that she wanted to keep because the Romans wanted to come in and take all her land. And she lived about 1000 AD. Isn't that amazing, Miss Sylvia? A yes. Celtic warrior from 1000 AD who did fight for her land and was able to keep it. So let's see who else we have. Oh, yay. Art. Sorry about that. Some of my books fell over, but who was Joan of Arc? I love these who was biographies, Miss Sylvia. They're really nice. And this one is by Pam Pollock. And look at her. Do you believe that Joan of Arc was only 19 years old when she died for her country? But she was born in 1492 in France. And France was fighting England. And she actually wore armor and carried a sword. And she was one of the warriors who was fighting to put the king back on the throne in England. So I think she is amazing, an amazing teenager. And sadly, she was put to death by being burned at the stake. But to the very end, she stood firm for her king. And I really appreciate the trailblazing woman that she was. All right, I think we have time for one more. Oh, I like her. All right. Murasaki Shikabu, she was actually a Japanese novelist, one of the very first women novelist in the world. She also lived around 1000 AD and she wrote 
a really long novel. Look at her. Here's a picture. Oh, wow. She's writing in Japan, Japanese. And this is a quote from the book that she wrote, The Tale of Genji. It says, no art or learning is ever to be pursued half-heartedly. Any art worth learning will certainly reward less generously the effort made to study it. And I love that. It really just basically is telling you, keep learning. It's worth it. You have to put the time in to keep learning. And that is from this wonderful book, What Would She Do? And it's 25 True Stories of Trailblazing Rebel Women. And that is what we're talking about today. So there's so many books, Miss Sylvia. I wish we had time to talk about all these other women on the wheel. But because we don't, I hope everyone else will check out those names. Yeah, definitely check those names out. So many great trailblazers that we learned about during our research for this class. Okay. So we've learned about some notable firsts and some ancient leaders. Now we are going to start talking about the path to women's rights here in the United States. So early in our formation of our country, women were disenfranchised. That meant that they didn't have the same rights as men. So they couldn't vote like the video told us. Uh, they were unable to own property, if they had a job, they could not keep their own money. Uh, and a lot of women were unable to go to school. And many women wanted that to change. They wanted to be able to be represented by their government. They wanted to be able to go to school, learn, earn money, have jobs, have rights. So that started the beginning of the path to what we know as the women's rights movement. So here, in 1780, oops, uh, there was the Ladies Association of Philadelphia created by Esther Reed. And this was during the revolution and she wanted to encourage women to get involved. Women were doing a lot of things around the country to support different movements and she wanted to encourage them to keep doing that. 1789, the constitution was ratified. That means it was updated. And instead of just saying men throughout the document, started using terms like persons and people and electors. So that kind of broadened how it could be applied in some ways. In 1792, this picture here on the left uh, is of the cover of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which was uh, written by Mary Wollstonecraft. This really was one of the first documents that challenged the belief that women should only be educated to serve men in the home and in other domestic ro roles. So that was the beginning of, we need to change how we see women in our society. Uh, and then also in that same year, there was the Litchfield Female Academy founded in Connecticut. And this started the beginning of more educational opportunities for women. And then keep going, we have here, oops, uh, the path to women's rights, the 1800s and the 1830s and 1840s, we saw some increases for women's rights. However, very, very small. For example, in Kentucky in 1838, uh, school suffrage became available for widows. So those are women whose uh, husbands had passed away and it was allowing them to vote for school board members. And in Mississippi a year later, women were able to own property. However, they could only do so if they had their husband's consent. So it was like some slight improvement, but they still had to rely on uh, a man in their life in order to get those rights. So women kept fighting. Uh, they wanted to have that representation. They still helped with different movements. They helped with uh, the abolitionist movement to abolish slavery in America. Women were helping with prison reform and education and health reform. And finally, in 1848, there was a Seneca Falls Convention that was formally held to discuss women's rights. And there was a document uh, called the Declaration of Sentiments signed. And here uh, in this book, what is the women's rights movement? Uh, it's a part of the same series like Miss Heidi showed for Joan of Arc. 
This one is by Deborah Hopkinson, and it gives a lot of information about the early start of women's rights movement, as well as where we are now. Uh, the uh, document, the Declaration of Sentiments was, this is a picture of all the people who signed. You can see there were men and women that signed. So a lot of people starting to think that they wanted to give women more rights in our country. Uh, two of those notable women, you can see here, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were very, very uh, critical in the women's rights movement early on. And at this, doc, at this uh, Seneca Falls Convention, there was a formal, these are the things that we see are wrong and these are things that we wanted to be fixed. So I'm just gonna slide this Heidi over a little up here. Okay, so in 1850, there was the first National Women's Rights Convention uh, and then the Civil War happened. So with the Civil War came some pause on the women's rights movement because uh, there was other things happening as far as trying to uh, keep our country together and issues with slavery and really trying to focus on getting our country in a place that we could function. So uh, from 1865 to 1920, after the Civil War, there were various organizations and groups that were founded to keep pursuing women's rights. One of the first one was American Equal Rights Association. This was as the abolitionists and the women's rights movement were working together to get voting rights for African Americans and women. Uh, and then during the passing of the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments, there became this separation of women's rights movement from the African-American abolitionists, unfortunately, because when the 15th Amendment was passed, only men were given the right to vote. And women who were working for the women's rights movement wanted women to have that right too. And so it's caused this separation and this rift between African-American abolitionists and women who are working strictly for the women's rights movement. And due to that, there were some other important ladies that I'd like to mention. Uh, Sojourner Truth, who was involved from the very beginning along with Elizabeth Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony uh, to get votes for women and votes for African Americans. And also Ida B. Wells, she was very critical as well in terms of uh, she was a journalist and she shared a lot of information about what was happening to African Americans in our country. And when that rift happened between the women's movement and the abolitionist movement, she actually started the National Association of Colored Women's Club so that they could pursue uh, voting rights for African American women specifically. So there was a lot happening. In 1916, Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to the House of Representatives. You can see her picture down at the bottom. Uh, that's actually the ticket she ran on so that you could know what she stood for and could vote for her if you were wanted to do that. And in 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed and women received full voting rights in the United States. However, this comes with the caveat that this did not apply to all women, unfortunately. Uh, women of color were still facing restrictions when voting, and it really wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that everyone was given their equal right to vote. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. Okay. Miss Sylvia, what a history so far that yes. you've shown us, and it's sad in a way that it's taken us so long to get even as far as that. 1965, if you were living right before that, Miss Sylvia, you couldn't have voted. And that is not right. That is wrong. But let's see what else we kept going. So in 1909, that began with Women's Day first observed on February 28, 1909, a long time ago. And then it was later changed to March 8th that that early video talked about. And then President Jimmy Carter established Women's History Week formally in 1980. 
And now we know in March that we have Women's History Month. And I think there is a wonderful video that we have to see about Women's History Month. But before we look at that, I wanted to show, just remind you, 2020, the House of Representatives voted to build a Women's History Museum on the National Mall. But they just voted that that should be done. So right now, the Women's History Museum is only online. There's a ton of information you can find out if you just looked up Women's History Month. But it is not a building yet, but it will be. Right, Miss Sylvia? That's right. Yep. Okay. So we are going to take a look at another PBS video that will give us some information about Women's History Month within the United States. In the United States, March is Women's History Month. It honors women's contributions in all areas of life as scientists, inventors, artists, politicians, and more. The celebration began in 1978 when the school district of Sonoma, California hosted a week-long recognition of women's accomplishments throughout history. The idea spread, and in 1980, President Jimmy Carter proclaimed the week of March 8th National Women's History Week. Six years later, an organization called the National Women's History Project convinced Congress to dedicate the entire month of March to women's history. Each year, a special focus for the month is declared by the National Women's History Project. For example, important artists like photographer Dorothea Lange and painter Mary Cassatt have been celebrated. Pioneers such as educator Mary McLeod Bethune, Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross, Amelia Earhart in aviation, and First Lady Michelle Obama have also been honored. Women's History Month celebrates unsung heroes too. The countless women who helped when our country was at war. Women who run businesses and volunteer in their communities. Single mothers who work and raise families. And the unknown writers and artists in history whose works were never made public, yet teach historians much about our country's past. Which women in your life would you like to celebrate? Another great question there, Miss Sylvia. Which woman in your life would you like to celebrate? And right now, we're going to look at some of those women who are currently being the change makers or who recently were change makers on the rise in their communities. So let's go back, share a screen here. And one moment, I have to change it. I always forget about that. We need to open, look at all those wonderful wow. names on there. So we may, of course, not be able to get to all of them, but you should make a note of all those names that we don't share and make sure you read up on them. So mm -hmm. we are going to take turns. Here we go and see who we get today. <laughs> Yay! Yay! You just talked about her, Miss Sylvia. I did. So this will be really short and sweet, but she again was the first woman elected to Congress, and her work allowed for the passage of the women's uh, right to vote, the 19th Amendment, because she was able to really push that within the government. And without her, it would have been a little more difficult. It was good for women to be able to have representation within our um, government. So that was great. That's Jeanette Rankin. Love that. Thank you, Miss Sylvia. Here we go again. All right. I think we've all heard about her by now, but this information I got also from the Who Was section, Who Was Mother Teresa. This one was written by Jim Gigliotti. And Mother Teresa was actually born in 1910. But in 1979, she won the Nobel Peace Prize. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize because she did so much work working with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. And she didn't care about 
so much about her personal life, but she was dedicating to serve the poorest of the poor. So I always think that she is a great trailblazer that we need to emulate. Mother. Awesome. All right. I think we have time for a couple more. Let's see who else we get. All right. Oh, another one of my favorites. She's been called the champion of the chimpanzees. She has dedicated her life to being a scientist so that we can learn about this amazing animal. And she was also the earlier part of the 20th century in the 1900s. She is still 80 years old today. She is still alive and she is still working on behalf of the chimpanzee. So if you ever want to be a scientist, she is a wonderful trailblazer to look towards. Mm -hmm. And I got her information also from the same book. What would she do? She is one of those trailblazers we're talking about. All right, let's see who else we can look at. Do you want me to spin it again, Miss Sylvia? I know yes, we talked about Ida Wells. I think so. Yep. Ida B. Wells is very, very important in both the abolitionist and women's rights movement. And we talked about how she started a separate foundation to advocate for their rights. She did a lot of um, writing as well and brought a lot of light to social injustices that were happening in America. So she is definitely a trailblazer. But I think we can do someone else too. Yes. Yeah, so okay because I know you did talk about her a lot before, but she is so important along with Susan B. Anthony. Oh my goodness, now we're getting repeats. Let me go <laughs> <laughs> It won't let me go again and see the oh. There's just so many names, boys and girls, There's so many wonderful women who have gone before us. Oh my goodness, I think everyone knows who this is. Oh, All right. Voila. Malala. I love her. She is still alive today, too. Yes. Yeah, and she's one. Yep. I have on her. And she was shot by the Taliban, but she's still fighting for equal education in the world. In 2012, which wasn't that long ago, boys and girls, she was in Pakistan and she was just going to school when the Taliban came in and shot her because they didn't like the idea of women getting educated. She mm -hmm. continues after she was healed. She continues fighting for education today. She didn't let them stop her from wanting to be educated and wanting to see a lot of other girls educated in countries where sometimes it is difficult for girls to get education. And I think you have another book on her too, Miss Sylvia. I do. Yes. I wanted to share this book, Malala, My Story of Standing Up for Girls' Rights. Uh, and it's written by her, so it's her autobiography. But the cool thing about this one is it's a wonder book. So it will actually read to you as well. Um, and so I just wanted to share that so that you could see we have some other types of resources uh, and you can just turn it on and it shows you in here how it works, but it's a really great way to learn about Malala, some more information. I love that. And as you can see on this screen and on this wheel, there's so many wonderful names we just don't have time to talk about at the moment. But Miss Sylvia later in our program will share all the wonderful books we have for you. So we hope you take the time to look those up. And I wish awesome. we did have time to talk about all of them today. But yes. I know we want to talk about how you can make a difference in your community. And where does that start? Where do you think, Miss Sylvia? Starts with you. Starts with you. Take a look in the mirror right now. You yourself are a change maker and you can be a change maker right now. So here are some ideas that we have for you. You can Check out some local organizations in your area to see how you can get involved in your community. I know sometimes there's Girl Scouts and mm -hmm. there's cleanup crews and there's food banks and there's all kinds of ways that you can get involved right now in your community. 
and start small. It doesn't have to be this huge group that you join right away. You can start by when you go a, on a walk with your family around the neighborhood, picking up some trash mm -hmm. and putting it away and getting it off the street. So it can just start small right where you live. You need to stay informed about important facts. It's too easy with so much information out there and so much news to get distracted by what might not be real or what's going on. So make sure you get all the facts and stay informed so that if someone asks you what you would like to do to be a change maker, you might have some answers for them. Volunteer that goes along with you being the change maker. Make sure you take time to volunteer in your schools or in your family or if something comes up in your neighborhood. And bring yourself, bring your talents, stay positive. There's so much you can do, but you might need to grow into that and learn some things first, but you are enough in yourself to do it. So thank you for going ahead of us and being a trailblazer too. Awesome. All right, so like Ms. Heidi said, I'm gonna show you how to get to some uh, resources on our website. There are a ton, a ton of resources to share with you. So here is a picture of our website so that you can see. This is uh, the learning from home resources for elementary school students. And to get here, you could go to youth and educators and then there's a section for elementary school. Uh, and when you click on that, it'll take you to this page. And at the bottom of this page is a section called Research and Explore New Subjects. These are the databases that we looked at to get information for this presentation. Uh, the first one, Elementary Research, is filled with articles, photos, all kinds of things that you could find on so many topics. Uh, but I found a lot of articles uh, about Women's History Month, but also biographies that were really interesting as well. Uh, National Geographic Kids and Pebble Go also have lots of biographies and historical information. And then Truflix, similar with uh, interactive books that you could read to learn more information for your research. So those are from our website. And then we have two slides of some of the resources we use to come up with our information. We have book sources. Uh, we also have our website and research sources. I already went through the learning from home ones, but the website I wanted to point out is the National Women's History Museum website, which is womenshistory.org. Uh, like Ms. Heidi said, right now it's all online. Uh, we are hoping to move toward a physical space in the future now that that's been passed by the house. Uh, and their website is like an online exhibit. You can find so many sources of information. It's really cool to look at. They have different um, topics that they focus on all the time. And with national, well, with Women's History Month, the theme uh, being about women gaining the right to vote, there's a lot about that still. Uh, and yeah, just check it out. So much good stuff on there. I love that. And Miss Sylvia, I just wanted to mention one of those books again, Blast Back. Oh, yeah. That's a series of books, a push into the past. I know it's on our list, but this is only about women's suffrage, which is women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to remind you, talking about being the change makers, there are still two places in the country where it's very difficult for yeah. women to vote. And one is in Saudi Arabia. Now in 2005, they, or 2011, the king did give women the right to vote, but it is still very difficult for them to actually mm -hmm. vote in Saudi Arabia. And then Vatican City in Rome, in Italy, women mm -hmm. cannot vote in Vatican City. So that is two places where there's still maybe change to be made. But you can read about that in this book and then in so many other history books that we have listed for you there too. That's right, so many sources. So we hope you check them all out because there's so many great things to see and learn even more about. So much that we couldn't even talk about, we didn't have enough time. So those are our resources. And before we end, we are gonna go and look at our quiz again and see what we've learned about women's history through our same true false quiz. All right, question one. 
Women's History Month was first celebrated in the United States in 1909. True or false? I think we said false, Ms. Sylvia, but now I know even more about why that is false. Yes, it was false because Women's History Month was first celebrated in 1987 in the United States, so much later than 1909. Started out as a day and then a week and then it made its way to a month. Okay, question two. Women were unable to own property, earn wages, or get an education well into the 1800s. True or false? Yes, I think that sadly is true. There was true. Right. Uh, women were disenfranchised for a very long time. That meant that they could not vote. They didn't have the same rights for education and work. And luckily that's changed over the time. But like Ms. Heidi said, there's still places where women are still working to get some of those rights. So we have to keep pushing. Question three. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote in the United States in 1920. True or false? Yes. Thankfully, that is true. That is true. It took nearly 100 years for women to gain the right to vote. From when they first started some of their uh, organizations and uh, meetings that they were happening until the 19th Amendment was passed. And however, remember, though, that everyone wasn't able to vote at that time. So for some women, women of color, it took much longer and it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Okay, question four. National Women's History Museum is physically located on the National Mall. True or false? Now you tried to get us with this question, Ms. Sylvia. <laughs> so we did learn that that is false because it's not physically there yet, but it will be. That's right. So it's solely online, but it has a lot of great information and we're hoping for a physical museum soon in the future. So I hope you learned a lot from that. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. We really had a great time working with you and learning about women's history and trailblazers. Uh, please feel free to send any feedback and questions that you may have, but we will have this available for you to follow up with resources, and we hope to see you next time. See you next time, and don't forget that you are the change maker. You Bye. Are. Bye.